the sun, our source of life. What relationship do we have with her? I'm happy to welcome you here on behalf of Podcast Zwijger and the Solar Biennale to this fourth and last part in the series of solar talks. And this time we're going to fo focus on the spatial aspect of things. So how does this solar revolution play out on our surfaces, in our buildings, in our cities? And uh, we're going to explore all those different uh, perspectives and, and, and layers of, uh, of the topic. Uh, my name is Lynn Zebeda. I'm happy to uh, have seen you through the whole series up to this point. I've learned so much and I'm really excited to um, dive into the spatial today with very, very cool guests um, that I'm going to introduce you. Let me just tell you who is all going to be here at the table today. Uh, first of all, we'll have Marianne van Aubel. She's a solar designer. She integrates solar and daily objects, building surfaces. Uh, how can surfaces generate energy and what could that look like? What beauty could that add to our lives as well? We have Paul Voskuyle. Uh, Paul works for the AMS Institute, also known as the Amsterdam Institute for Advanced Metropolitan Solutions, right? Um, we'll hear, hear all about that, but it's about exploring where is the potential for things like solar energy in the energy transition and how can work of thinkers, academics, be translated into actual solutions in the city. Uh, and lastly, we'll have Tom Minderhout, who is an architect at the UN Studio and an expert on solar and how we can integrate that in buildings in a very integral way, actually, uh, and in a beautiful way as well. Uh, and he also set up Solar Visuals, um, a new spin-off where you can design your own solar facades. Uh, so I'm excited to introduce them all to you. We're going to listen to their presentations uh, and go into conversations with them in the first hour. And then after that, we'll have a bit more time with all of us here that are here present uh, to go into questions and more uh, conversation and deepening what we find most interesting about this. All right? Yay! Yay. <laughs> Ready? Yay. Okay. Uh, fantastic. So I would love to invite Marianne von Aubo to uh, present to us her work and thoughts. Let's give her a round. Thank you, Lynn. I can't believe it's already the last of the series of four. It's get, went so quick. I know. Yeah. So my name is uh, Marianne, and um, I would like to tell you something about uh, solar design. There's a clicker here. Um, because uh, how did we des design with the sun in the past? For example, this is an, uh, uh, an uh, example of how the Greek used to build their houses positioned towards the sun. So they positioned in such a way that they were oriented towards the south, so they would stay cool in summer and warm in winter. Just an example. Similar that is the, as the, uh, the ancient uh, uh, Chinese did as well. But kind of, it's kind of interesting that we stop doing this, uh, that we really like st uh, looked at ci uh, cities differently. And if you think about the fact that every day we receive enough sunlight to provide the world with enough electricity for an entire year, that amount of sunlight and we kind of like stop using t the power of the sun and we stop designing with the sun. That's kind of like an, a sort of an amazing fact that I'm like can't, can't grasp. And then we have solar panels. And this is an uh, image of uh, 1884. Can you like think about this fact, how old solar panels already are? So this is, uh, uh, they were installed for the first time here in a, on a rooftop in New York. And this is how solar panels look like today. The blue panels we know as a technology that are sort of stacked onto a roof. This is uh, Willem Alexander. Uh, I like, I don't know why I'm giving this example, but it's like <laughs> kind of like crazy to think that he wants to have like uh, solar panels on his uh, palace in on the nor uh, on his palace, and he wasn't allowed because it wasn't didn't fit uh, the the sort of the, the monument or something. So if you if you have like if you think about we we go into this energy transition and we stumble upon upon problems like this, that is not the way to go. And also think about like how are we going to fill our landscapes? How are these landscapes going to look like? Are we really uh, going to, yeah, especially in the Netherlands when, where uh, space is kind of like a scarcity, uh, just like put them all over or 
can we put them on the place where we directly need them in cities? And how are we going to design with that then? I think we need to start looking differently at uh, solar energy and really see it like sort of as a sort of addition. And this is an example of a, yeah, sort of a machine from 400 years ago. And I think there was opposition there as well. But 400 years later, we see it as a monument, as a statement for something we're proud of. And I wonder what we need to do that there will be buses of tourists that that drive through these uh, solar parks or solar in cities and see it as something that's part of our identity, our culture. And what do we need to do for that? So like I said, I'm a designer and I'm integrating uh, solar into uh, everyday life, into everyday objects. Uh, I'm going to give you some examples here. This is an example uh, of a collaboration I did together with Swarovski, the crystal company. And if you cut crystal in a certain way, you're able to bend and direct the light onto a certain place to make them more efficient. So really to use uh, aesthetics, but also uh, efficiency. And that combination is, I think, a very nice way to work with. So these uh, solar, yeah, mobile solar crystals, you can take into the to window. Uh, they would capture light and then in the evening you could put them in a sort of docking station and they would power these chandeliers. Another example of integrating solar in uh, sort of everyday objects is a uh, current table, where the whole tabletop consists out of uh, colored solar cells. And they work indoors as well. So you can plug your phone or whatever laptop into the, the table, and the table has kind of like a double function. It also works as a table, but also is sort of giving you, providing you power for, for what you need to do there. So the more surface you have, the more efficient you can uh, you can be, the more you can do. So here we integrate solar in uh, into windows in uh, London, and people from the street could come and uh, power their their houses. So it's really giving extra functions to objects. Windows not just a window but also a power source. This is uh, an example we did uh, uh, at in Dubai, the World Expo. Uh, where there's, uh, that's obviously for like six months only. And um, uh, we worked together with V8 architects. And the idea was to combine food, water and energy together in one building, a complete circular building. Uh, so there was like uh, rain captured from, uh, 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 from, the, from the air and was transformed into water uh, that we could drink from. There were plants growing uh, and we were uh, responsible for the, for the energy part. I'm going to show you the this. sun is for everyone. Every day, it provides us with an abundance of natural energy. But how can we use this incredible energy source more than we do? For the Netherlands Pavilion in Dubai, Marjan van Abel Studio has created a new solar experience using the solar panels of the future. The solar roof is made from lightweight, transparent solar cells produced with a limited environmental footprint. The colored organic photovoltaic film by Aska is made of solar cells printed on thin foils. The solar roof not only provides power for the pavilion, it also allows the right spectrum of sunlight through for the plants. You will see solar design in a whole new light as the colored solar roof bathes the pavilion in rays of color. Solar can be beautiful and create a whole new visual experience for everyone while collecting energy make beauty even more powerful. Yeah, so it's really thinking all the time about this different perspective of solar. So can, when you were in the sort of uh, pavilion, you could, you had this kind of like church-like feeling that, you, that uh, sort of the reflections were kind of like doing something on your skin and on the, on the plants and like a very nice reflection. So the shadows became like, also, yeah, it was kind of a, um, power play, which is a bit, a bit plain words, but um, this is an another example because the, because the uh, roof was so high, you couldn't really see these nice details of these organic uh, photovoltaics. So this is uh, Rao. It's a self-illuminated uh, artwork. It has a very thin uh, lead strip. Is the whole, so the whole work is just one millimeter thick, uh, and that you can hang in front of the window, and it's becoming like sort of like a new. Yeah, a new art form. So it's like a stained glass window and you can kind of, the, it's also making your house cooler as well. The last one, I'm going very quickly to this, is, um, yeah, 
Yeah, maybe I should. Yeah. So because the question is, what I would like to ask is what if we could consider a building or object to be broken if it doesn't generate its own energy? And if we start thinking like this and really start thinking, uh, yeah, what kind of like future would we like to leave behind? And how are we going to design things uh, and not like adding it last, but really start from the beginning? How is this going to... Uh, sort of power itself, that solar becomes like a sort of building block, a building material, then it changes our way how we look at things and how we design things. So then you can see a building completely like a sort of, uh, yeah, so all surfaces and uh, you, you have to yeah look uh, with the sun cycles and like how you can are going to position it. It's a really different way of, of looking at this. Uh, the last uh, is uh, this self-powering object. This is uh, Sanne, and uh, we did a kickstart, uh, Kickstarter last year with this. And it's a yeah, light that kind of like mimics the sun sunset. So the magical moment when the sun goes down, this kind of like captured uh, in this light. Because uh, So when the sun goes down, Sanne goes on automatically. So one side has solar panels, and uh, it's uh, kind of powered by, by solar then, and the other side is... Uh, is a natural light. It has three different settings, sunrise, sunlight, and uh, sunset. Yeah, and this was nice that we uh, uh, worked together with uh, TNO because it's, uh, yeah, it kind of like solar panels are made for outdoors. And then now we, you're working with solar panels that are indoors, behind glass. You don't know what kind of glass it is, what the orientation will be. So we developed them in such a way that they, they would like uh, capture more lighter levels than than uh, the, the panels on the on, on the roof. There was a super nice uh, collaboration there. And it's really sort of thinking like how can we make this technology, which is kind of like a technocratic point of view. It's we, we still think about this the, the the blue blue panels on the roofs, but how can we integrate that more naturally and and beautifully in our in our daily life and really look at the cycles of the sun again and uh, to have that in in our home. Thank you. Thank you so much, Marianne. I feel we can clap a bit louder for that. <laughs> That was so cool to see. Thank you for that. Pleasure. I'm really. Uh, what's your? Do you have any personal favorites in all your work that you just showed us? Yeah, I like I like uh, Sana a lot because it's also uh, uh, a work that's just like uh, recently been developed as well, and it's not only like uh, one light that's hanging in a museum. I think it's hanging in museums, but it's like now we're uh, setting up uh, a label Sana. And uh, that's, yeah, so people can have it in their home as well. So really f thinking from this like solar democracy, solar energy everywhere. Yeah. And um, yeah, it's, an, it's a nice process to go through to, uh, to really think, okay, how, how are we going to distribute that? How, uh, how yeah, it's, it's a different thing. So. Yeah, definitely. Really entrepreneurial mind. Yeah. And I'm also really wondering, like, when I look at this, I really feel like the future is here, you know? Like, it's pretty magical in terms of the possibilities and how you apply them makes me just super curious about where your mind is going next. Like, what, what is, what are you thinking about now? I mean, it's like, if you think about like every surface can be transformed into an activator, an energy activator, then everything is possible. Mm -hmm. So it's just a matter of like how and what, what can it do? And uh, uh, yeah, you, you have, yeah. I'm thinking also about like in hundred years. So yeah. what, what will be possible? Do we maybe, we won't have solar panels anymore because it will be integrated in paint. It will be integrated into whatever. We don't see it anymore. Yeah. Yeah. What excites you the most in that? Like what possibility inside all of that? I think it's just so nice that it's like, uh, that like light or something, you can't see what's happening. It's hitting a surface and it does something and you, you get something out of it. But now it's like so visible. And when it like, it also becomes something magical. Yeah. And then we can like perceive it like that. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Very interesting. And I also, you know, let's talk about the solar biennale because, yeah. you know, that's like this talk is part of the solar biennale and um, you co-founded it together with Pauline von Dunga, who just had a baby. There so you go. <laughs> <laughs> if you're Another watching song. Pauline and baby, <laughs> then uh, we're thinking of you. Um, but tell us a bit more about maybe, uh, does any, everyone here know the solar biennale? 
Yeah, no. Maybe just like summarize yeah, for us. That's yeah. nice. Because it's um, it's quite funny, actually. I met Pauline uh, three years ago now, nearly, at a conference of about the sun in Russia, St. Petersburg. And uh, I knew she was working with uh, solar energy, but we didn't know each other. And we were there like, wow, it's kind of crazy that we're kind of... Uh, uh, sort of not talking to each other and she's a fashion designer I'm a product designer yeah. and the, even the industry no one is really talking to each other so we sat in a bar drinking white Russians and said like <laughs> well let's start like a movement or something really to sort of speed up this uh, energy transition to change the narrative around solar energy yeah and um, so we said like yeah let's do it and I was thinking yeah that's what we say now but probably we're not gonna do it but we're actually doing it and uh, we had some um, discussions were invited uh, different uh, players in the world from the industry, philosophers, uh, a lot of different people. And we said, like, okay, how can we change this narrative? What do we need to do to change it from these blue panels to something that is er surrounded? We want to be surrounded with, it's part of our culture. And then we came up with the Solar Biennial yeah. to really start showing this, bringing these people together, everyone together, uh, and doing it. Yeah. And so you did. And then we are doing it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And so the first, maybe you can tell us a little bit about like what's happening now this year, the first solar bi biannual. Yeah. So it's like uh, the solar biennial is the first like uh, thing that the solar movement organizes. It's the first thing. So the idea of the solar movement is, as, as Palace would say, it, we're, we're going to do this globally. And uh, we're starting here in the Netherlands, in uh, Rotterdam and Eindhoven. Actually, we're starting in Amsterdam here. Yeah. <laughs> <Which is actually laughs> yeah we did that. Yeah. Um, uh, and then uh, every two years it will travel to another continent. Yeah. So in uh, in Rotterdam we um, start off with a, a seminar. There will be a, an exhibition in the new institute called the Energy Show. There will be different installations in the in the um, uh, in the city Rotterdam. Uh, different labs where people can like join for four days and uh, also like really make things, uh, probe things like the idea of like what if solar becomes a material. What do we need to, how does it work? Uh, and really bring all these industries again together. And also we'll, uh, we'll make a pavilion, build a pavilion in the Dutch Design Week again. And uh, yeah, there will be more uh, labs and lectures. Yeah, 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 yeah. Exciting. And so we are all here part of the start of this solar movement. Uh, but I'm curious about... Maybe as a last question for now, like where where do you hope that this solar movement will take us? Like, what what are your hopes and dreams for for the movement? Yeah, that's a good question because also like there's like okay, we're gonna change the world on the solar and, and like do this transition, but it's like more important like how are we gonna do that and like how do that in like a sort of clever way? Mm -hmm. So not that we're like filling all these lands landscapes up, but I think in twenty years they need to be gone, you know. Uh, so um, what needs to be gone? The solar panels in on landscapes. That's they, need like to, they need to be gone. Yeah, that's we like one we of need the to have conclusions. In, yeah, yeah. But, I mean, a landscape doesn't need a solar panel. It needs to be like integrated in the place where it's needed. Yeah. And, um, yeah. So it's also like difficult. We don't know where we will go, and it also that's nice about the solar biennial that we will raise more questions even uh, on the way. Right. And how are we going to, indeed, in this revolution, this narrative shift that you're saying, it's about integration into our lives it's about maybe seeing possibility it's about aesthetics as well it's about beauty or wh yeah. what is it really the essence of like the shift you feel also maybe in the spatial sense as we're yeah, talking yeah, about yeah, that yeah. now yeah because especially in cities there are a lot of like i mean i think we'll hear more about that later that yeah. uh, there are a lot of like surfaces unused and stuff yeah. and like uh, can we use like for example data centers or distribution centers and batteries for the cities that would kind of like power the city itself and uh, um, there are like so many other opportunities in the city itself yeah yeah exactly so it's finding clever ways to do clever things yeah. in our cities to uh, uh, transition in a way more beautiful way than we could have imagined maybe so thank you for now Mariam uh, let's bring in our next speaker uh, we're gonna first listen to his presentation Paul Voskuyle from the AMS Institute. Let's give him a warm welcome as well. Thank you. Thank you very much for inviting me and uh, to have a talk from AMS Institute. Maybe it would be nice to give a very brief introduction what AMS is, so just see in the, in the room who knows what AMS does and what we are. 
Okay, that, that's only two people. So maybe it might be <laughs> nice to explain a little bit. Um, we are operating since eight years in Amsterdam, and the idea is to, to have an institute uh, that serves the challenges uh, of the metropolitan region of Amsterdam and in many other metropolitan regions around the world um, by applying academic best practices, uh, developing new solutions, and make that direct connection to the problem that, there's, uh, that, that cities have. Um, in the meantime, we also have a very big entrepreneurial program and an educational program where we have 120 master students um, being supervised by TU Delft and Wageningen uh, in, the co in a course called Metropolitan Analysis Design and Engineering, uh, where we are actually grooming all these engineers to develop these solutions. I'm here to tell you today about our solar energy program. I work as a uh, program developer for the Urban Energy Research and Innovation Program. Um, and one of the most exciting projects that we worked on the last, uh, last couple of years that is uh, showing real spin-off in, in actual use and, and, and uh, benefits for the city and the city government as well, um, we worked on the solar panel advent calendar. So you would imagine we can integrate solar panels in many different ways, different levels, but we have the standard size solar panel, and we always try to see what is the best fit for a roof, what's the business case, um, how many solar panels can we have. But yeah, it all starts with data. Based on understanding how many solar panels we can have, we also understand the challenges better and, and can better have advice for policy manage, uh, for, for policy updates or new product development. Um, in this project, we're mainly seeing also, okay, just like in the Christmas time, the advent calendar, what buildings should have solar panels when? 2027, 2028, and that can be based on a different group of parameters which uh, I'm gonna explain you a little bit about. This project was also in collaboration with Mart, who's also here. Uh, he actually did most of the work, so, so very much thank you for, for that, Marta. Um, but the policy of the city of Amsterdam is no roof unused. You heard that when we said, okay, uh, maybe not windmills in Eiburg, maybe we can add some more solar panels. Okay, but we already have the policy, no roofs unused. So what does that mean? A roof fully used. How many solar panels can we really have in the city? Um, so that's, that's what we looked at. So if you look at the entire city, we looked at, okay, a specific district, in this case, the pipe in Amsterdam. What if we look at all the services in this area, existing built environment? How did we do that? Of course, with the scientific method, which is all available on open research. I don't know if you're familiar with open research, but you can find on open research at openresearch.amsterdam everything on this method and the idea is that there's every year there's a plane flying over the Netherlands um, uh, gathering data about what is the the, the, um, yeah, the physical uh, space that we have in, in, in the Netherlands and how does it look like if you put it into a cl uh, point cloud and how can you make surfaces out of that and that's actually the work that we did and this is one of these buildings in the pipe and, and by this method by, by using that data that's openly available we identified surfaces in the existing city. Um, but if you have a great irradiation plane on a roof, then how can we fit this standard solar panel in? And that's also why we have the, the collaboration in the Solar Biennale, is to find better shapes or better integration patterns on every service. And this is just showing what are the current yeah, impossibilities or, or, or optimization things that you need to take into account in order to fit as many as possible. You see here, what is the surface that has a good irradiation of, of sun? And this is the calculation method in, in 3D, shown on the left side, the results on how many solar panels you can have if you fill in the entire roof. And on the right side, you uh, see a realized project. And, and typically, these are uh, safety cautions or economic uh, reasons or ownership reasons why these full roofs are not uh, used. Uh, how would it look like typically in a, in, a, in a building currently? So this is what you don't want to see in Marianne. But in the end, this is currently how people are deploying it. Very nice to have in AMS also project to see how we can move with all these uh, traditional solar panels into circular solar pa panels and reuse the materials um, because a lot of these solar panels will come back on the market later. Um, but, but okay, maybe numerizing everything together is this crucial number of 32%. So for this area, if you want to have full usage of the entire roofs, you can only use 32% of the roof of the detected area due to chimneys or planes or whatsoever. So, so that's already uh, uh, quite a challenge. And then if we look at the advent calendar, you can see, okay, but what are different challenges that we also have? So, so um, of course we have the standard size. And the reason why we do this is that to show what are the, the, the challenges if you work with standard size panels and standard orientations. You cannot use all the surface there. Typical issue that we also very much uh, are, 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 are showing in this data 
is that these ownership boundaries, so, so I have a roof, I'm the owner of my roof, is cutting a lot of space for solar panels. And by this, these type of data analysis, we can show what, what, what the effect is of not using all these roofs. So it, we prefer projects for, for collective use uh, of the roof rather than individual homeowners. Um, you can bring it into policy. General numbers. So where we are, 2021. We need to pr progress a lot if we want to go to full potential. So this is the challenge. And of course, I agree with you both for not putting solar panels, okay, maybe in the transition period, on in the landscape. Then we still have the ugly panels in the city. But after 20 years, this entire uh, uh, diagram needs to be higher, more solar panels, more generation, if you can also use the services that we're currently not using. Um, considering the, the city-wide, uh, I think uh, that's okay. Um, coming to the advent calendar, um, we looked at where are these solar panels feasible, but also what is the capacity in the electricity grid. So we can add a lot of solar panels, but the entire country doesn't have a grid connection available for generation. So how does that work in the city center? Um, maybe you can see that the electricity grid is already good until 2028. So maybe solar panels are good until then. So that's the advent calendar coming into place. Uh, historic builds with, with buildings with natural insulation moments, uh, roof rooftop renovations, uh, any ideas regarding uh, water containment on the roof of the building, integration of green roofs, of course, and anyth anything regards uh, rooftop terraces, because these are, of course, uh, um, yeah, are objecting uh, the, the integration of solar panels. And putting this into, into place together, we can show the city that, that there's multiple policies working together uh, or also objecting each other. So how can we make sure that for every roof we know to install in the right moment, in the right time? Um, and this is one of these visualizations that we worked on in order to show and also to, uh, to, in, to, make, to make citizens uh, more enthusiastic about solar panels because the people here are very enthusiastic about solar panels. Um, but, but there's still a lot of convincing to do, although we are rising very high right now on the adoption rate, but it can always be bigger, of course. Um, and, and the idea is also to show these kind of visualizations, and I, I think everybody from UN Studio or Marianne can do a more visually attractive job. But the idea, of course, is to have the entire city covered in solar panels on the roof, not on the surface, and maybe also on the facades. So how many solar panels would you then have and what kind of issues bring that to Leander, the grid operator? Maybe lastly, um, this is what we also try, what we're also, do, also doing currently is that the city is having collective purchasing uh, solutions, uh, uh, actions. So if you buy now a solar panel or collectively, then you get a discount. But some people live in a heritage site, so they live in the historic city district. So they have a lot of permits to comply with. All this data that we gathered, you think maybe, okay, that is very uh, technical or, or a big very quantification of such a beautiful thing as a solar panel. But this is very much helping also the integration of solar panels by providing the city an analysis of which solar panels are currently seeable, which is, I, I would say, still a good thing because it's advocates sustainability. But in the same time, people think it's sometimes a reason not to take solar panels because of aesthetics. Also with permits. So by doing this analysis, together with the city, we can show which planes in the heritage sites are visible from the streets from different points of view. Give an example. Um, the city didn't ha doesn't have any criteria yet very formalized. So there is always an expert group to decide whether the permit can be given or not. By doing this calculation, we said, okay, but how many locations do you need to see the, the solar panel? We can show, uh, Marta, your analysis showed that 14% of the solar panels cannot be placed if you would say, okay, you can see the solar panel from one point in the street. That's such an amount of solar panels we cannot use. And only by doing this kind of work, um, yeah, we can support city policies. And this is actually being used right now in, in that uh, uh, collective purchasing action by the city for the postal code of the 1012, which is the red light district area. Um, yeah, and I think with that, we are continuously doing this work. Please, if you're interested in any of this very boring academic work, mm -hmm. but very helpful, please visit openresearch.amsterdam. Everything is available there, so you can just go mm -hmm. through it. We will continue to work on this, but also to see which solar panels do you need to have for electricity generation, but we also have a heat transition in the city. So what type of solar uh, thermal panels do we want to include? Those are solar panels that also include the generation of heat, hot water. And you can imagine with the transition from the gas, that might be a very helpful asset to know that.
I think that's the gist nice. of it. Thanks a lot, Paul. Please join us here. A whole other story. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and I'm really interested to hear your reaction as well, Marianne, because, you know, we're excited about this idea of, yeah, all roofs covered in solar panels. How do you feel when you hear that? Yeah, first of all, I really like the visualization. <laughs> it's like yeah. su super nice. And uh, yeah, I wonder, like, how do you calculate or estimate kind of like the sort of the potential of this and like how how do you really do that if how the kind of the need for for uh, that people actually are adopting this so so um of course there's contemporary models for for economic uptake and and, and uh, the, the subsidy arrangement that we have in the netherlands so, so if you i just saw a map on linkedin that if you would see a solar panel as a light dot on europe then we always have the same image about when europe is when it's dark you see a very big upcoming light, so we're growing fast. The technical calculations are, 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 are in, 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 in the documentation, and that's mainly about potential. We want to show what is the true potential, so um, the calculated potential. And, and of course, we just hope that everybody goes start installing them, and therefore we are providing a lot of analysis to, to support those investment decisions or, or by any means uh, changing behavior or whatsoever. But uh, yeah, the technical analysis is mainly used as it's looking at services and, and showing what policy can do and, and, and the standard size of a solar panel can do with the, the usable service, which is uh, cutting the surface by a third, which is uh, remarkable, I would say. Yeah. But then your question is really about the human side of it. Like, how do we make sure that then the technical analysis matches Indeed, what you're saying, the behavioral, that will we actually do it or how can we influence that part? Yes, yeah, so, so for instance, people currently in the permit, uh, uh, to getting a permit, they need to provide the information that her the, the, the solar panels are not visible. So this actual, this, this data analysis shows yeah. the city and the user locally in the heritage site yeah. what solar panels are visible from the street. I still think that's absolutely ridiculous that we cannot accept solar panels for a temporary period. But that's my personal opinion. Um, but in this transition phase and understanding the heritage side as well, we can say, okay, what do you mean by this? And therefore, we are actively supporting the hassle, taking away the hassle for citizens in order to have this uptake of solar panels. Yeah. 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 And, and, and we're and then also working with these visualization, of course, to show how your house would look like. So the photorealistic yeah, exactly. image yeah. of the buildings can say, okay, maybe I can just accept it and it will be fine. Yeah. No. But I'm still curious, Marianne, because this is like a, a long-term vision that you're working towards. Like, how can we cover as much surface as possible on the roofs with solar panels? Is that also how you would approach it if you were in Paul's shoes? I mean, I'm kind of like happy I'm not in your shoes because you have to like <laughs> think about that. Also, work with like the, the the city council and stuff and all these regulations. And it's like, I mean, I guess like, you have this like sort of vision and. Uh, and then you have to like kind of like wait or something that it that's that this will happen because of the yeah you can't see solar panel from the street but like why can't the solar panel be beautiful so it fits the streets so like can you like change the regulation around for example so you make solar panels so they would fit in this uh, canal house yeah so so that's absolutely point of talk so so we can do a lot of great research projects and we're very happy to work also with the PVMD the photovoltaic materials and devices group in TU Delft, they also create a lot of fantastic products with uh, Professor Olino Isabella and Miro Zeeman, and, and they can come up with an enormous amount of solutions. But in the end, yeah, if, if policy or, 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 or um, regulations are, are withholding the integration of these panels, we can only provide new insights, more information, and support those decision makers in order to help them make different decisions. But I'm curious about that, indeed, how you do that, because as you're referring to, you're working in this environment and you with the policy in the municipality and you have a lot of rules and permits and numbers and uh, protocols and uh, not that much space for really visionary work, maybe, or that's how I, I no, there, there what are, I'm projecting. There are very nice projects ongoing, yeah. but, but if you look at general policy, that's evolving slowly. Mm. Uh, and, and with that, we can only support that transition by, by, by showing alternative perspectives. Yeah, but so how do you influence that? Because I do feel you guys are working on some like, visionary, like, free thinking 
well, projects? Th- that's How do you th- that's the benefit that? also of, of this project and, and maybe some uh, um, not so regular projects is that we had the freedom to operate and uh, identify um, every s- service here and our, our program by ourselves. And that's also a benefit that AMS sometimes can do, that we see a research, strategic research directive that we think, okay, we need to exploit this and we just need to make sure that we are in control of the data, that we understand what we are doing, we are what we understand what we're calculating, but also understand the practical barriers. So we also definitely worked also with local energy cooperatives uh, in the pipe, for instance, to discuss what are their barriers, how are their solar panel placements look like, can we do anything regarding uh, communicational support. Yeah. Um, so that's an ongoing active process. So that's uh, also really your mandate and the municipality provides ma- that ma- space <laughs> for you. It's just something that we very much uh, like to put like to do yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah yeah but it's an important role then to really like keep on pushing all the time to like to uh, change the regulation a bit and that they, they yeah it's quite an important middle uh, position you have there you, because you see all the sort of the innovation at the TU Delft and then you see like what's what is not possible and then how you have yeah. to navigate between the, those two yeah it always helps to show in a, in a pilot or in a, such an analysis what is possible or what are we actually talking about? Mm-hmm. It's great that you are maybe conservative for the right reasons for not allowing a certain integration of solar, but did you already see the other perspective? And, and with these visualizations, with the data analysis, we are providing an alternative answer. And and I, I, can, I can imagine, or, or this is typically a role why the city also wanted to have AMS Institute mm-hmm. to, to support with the other way of thinking. And, and that doesn't only come for solar panels, but also for the integration of, of heat systems or heat integration system for, yeah. for the historic city district. And only by uh, yeah by operating and, and creating insights, um, we can support that and, and driven by science. And that is, I think, our, our stronghold. Yeah, yeah, great. Thank you so much for now. Yep. As we uh, invite our next speaker, let's uh, encourage you in your work. <laughs> Some more claps. And as already introduced, our last speaker and presentation will be by Tom Minderhout, architect at UN Studios. Take it away. Hello. Uh, thank you for having uh, me here this evening uh, at the, the talks for the Solar Biennale. Uh, we're talking about solar cities. Um, maybe as a first introduction, um, Again, my name is uh, Tom Minderhout. I'm a senior architect at uh, UN Studio. Uh, we are an architecture office right here in Amsterdam uh, on the Stadhouderskade, uh, and we uh, operate globally. Uh, we mainly do architecture, but we're also involved in urban design, uh, experience design, product design, interior design, and we're also involved in research. So uh, that's how I actually came in, in t- into contact with the topic of uh, the sun and uh, integrating sun, uh, the sun, solar energy, uh, photovoltaics uh, in architecture. Uh, and I've been uh, yeah, uh, looking at this topic since 2011. Um, and I think the, the nice thing about the sun is that, say, uh, yeah, for us, uh, the sun is uh, the source of almost everything. It provides us uh, uh, daily uh, energy uh, as humans, uh, but also for uh, basically life on this planet. Uh, and um, yeah, what I thought would, was interesting for this evening is to see the, the, the Earth as the, the canvas for the sun. So uh, what you see here is, is a world map, and um, yeah, you can see you're working globally, but uh, I just put some uh, nice dots on the map of uh, buildings uh, I've personally worked on uh, in, the, in the past years. So uh, we did uh, towers in China, we did uh, stations in the Middle East, uh, we did small research projects in, in Europe. But the nice thing is all of these locations have uh, sun as a topic. Um, I think Marjan also touched upon it, uh, say you can think about solar energy in a very active way, but uh, even in the shape of buildings we can look at it in a passive way and to start to, to look at the local conditions, local traditions, local culture, uh, how do you use the sun in your designs. Um, and what we always say is, yeah, we're interested in uh, different things. So it can be a very small uh, wood cabin uh, up in Finland, uh, but it can also be complete uh, city interve- interventions. Um, but 
in general, the aim is how do we improve the livability uh, of cities uh, and places where, where we live in. So, for example, here in Frankfurt, uh, these are four huge towers, but part of the actual goal was to create a very livable uh, urban uh, space right at the bottom of the tower, which was previously a closed city block. And we introduced a very high density program uh, and uh, yeah, brought people to this uh, place. And, and with people come amenities and, and quality of life. This is one of our very early projects. Uh, yeah, we can we can use these interventions to improve the city. So I think everybody knows the Erasmus Bridge in, in Rotterdam. Uh, I think it's a very pretty bridge, but uh, uh, it was also the, the connection to, to the south side of the city. And actually it was uh, uh, the catalyst for the whole growth of Kop van Zuid and, and the further areas. So one of the topics we, we touched upon uh, in the past years, uh, and this is a very current topic because it's now also enshrined in regulation, uh, is that uh, buildings need to be energy positive. And if they need to be energy positive, uh, how do we actually do this? Um, what we say as architects is roughly a building up to three levels uh, can be done uh, and powered by only the roof. But after that, we need the facade. But once you put PV in the facade, it becomes so visible uh, that people tend to have uh, opinions on it. Uh, and they have uh, different opinions and they will not always agree. Um, so for that reason, and also thinking about uh, the future, uh, thinking about building projects that are slow, uh, we need a degree of flexibility. Uh, and we need uh, a little bit of a toolbox to, to create some design freedom. Um, I think our projects are mostly non-standard. Um, there is a thought. We try to kind of uh, model that thought. We use uh, all the help we can get. Uh, it can be uh, digital help uh, from software. It can be with robots. Uh, but uh, we start with a problem and then we start to apply uh, architectural strategies to solve that problem and to prove that we can actually actually make it. So I think here to the left you see the Mercedes-Benz Museum, and this was finished in 2006. Uh, and this was one of the first times that uh, yeah, a, a building was first constructed in software, after which it could properly be built. And we learned a lot from that. Um, and I think that's also the, the goal, that uh, with the knowledge gained from projects, we try to drive the research. Uh, and it can be in a very simple way, just going into the model room, testing stuff, uh, building a small uh, uh, scale model. Um, but the, the general idea is we need to improve uh, the status quo. So uh, this is not a visualization we did, <laughs> but I think you, you all get the point. Is that say, um, let's say if this is the, the future in 10 years with, with all the houses like this, I think, yeah, yeah. Let's say we can try to do it better. Mm. And uh, basically, in this small exo, you see where you could actually apply it. So it's the roof, it's the facade, uh, different areas. But as architects, this is the base uh, product given to us. And we took it apart just to see uh, yeah, what you actually need to make this thing uh, work. And then we started to think about ways to reassemble it. So yeah. It's a very technical story, but basically uh, solar cells are inside the PV module and they are electrically connected and they produce energy. And what we said is, why don't we take it apart and, and, and add more stuff, basically. So we said, instead of the ugly industrial stuff, we would like to make patterns, make colors, make compositions and, and play with it. Uh, and where we actually ended up with was the color. Uh, and uh, yeah, another technical part of the story is that uh, there was always this idea that solar panels needed to be as efficient as, as possible. We said, well, maybe there needs to be a balance. Maybe some people actually will accept a lesser efficiency as long as the thing looks really, really nice. Uh, and we, we, we set up a structure that with dots, uh, we could display any kind of content and color on the, on the module. Uh, and in between the dots, you can still have the sun falling on your module and, and actually functioning. 
these are some some uh, i'm going a bit faster now because of the time but these are some uh, principles in in the patent patent we we lodged and uh, it, it just shows that say anybody who has ideas can come to us and uh, design with us so it's also connects to the whole freedom of design idea uh, it is a product but it allows you flexibility if you want to have a facade with a forest on it you can make it if you want a different uh, print it's also possible uh, and this is some some images from how we uh, sampled it uh, also with Teno actually uh, and then also started to 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 increase the size so this is a full scale panel uh, 3.6 meter by 2 meter uh, and in the end, the goal is to come back to the buildings again. So I think this is an existing building which, uh, from UN Studio, which I quite like. And the idea was maybe the next step uh, with the color of, with the freedom of design in color, uh, we could also start to look at using this product to, to create 3D effects uh, or even full buildings. So I think those are just some thoughts we developed. Um, yeah, we're putting the, the idea out there. Uh, it's uh, it's it's nice stuff, and uh, we hope more and more people will adopt it and uh, bring this topic further. Thank you, Tom. <laughs> Thanks a lot. Please join us. Very cool. I'm curious again, Marianne. What, what's listening to his story and knowing his work? What what intrigues or excites you most in it? Yeah, what I really like, especially in the the solar part, is that uh, yeah, the, the solar panels were always were the way they are um, because of their the, the high price points, and uh, that's why we have to like look at efficiency because it was very expensive to have solar panels on roof, and now it's one of the cheapest source of energy there is. So it doesn't matter if you have like now you begin have like three solar panels, uh, and there was a price of like one solar panel maybe. Three, four years ago or something mm, so yeah. it's really changed that and now, now the question of e efficiency becomes a bit old-fashioned and then we can start printing on on it and um it doesn't matter if like it lo lo uh, loses a couple of percentage of this efficiency because yeah, it exactly. doesn't matter yeah because is that why the old ones are always the same blue yes <coughs> yeah, Short it answer. <laughs> yeah it's, it's driven yeah. by an industry and yeah. the in industry was very specialized in making it more and more efficient. So basically coming from the solar panels that went up in satellites and those kind of things. Mm -hmm. And now we need to do this paradigm shift to bring it into the built environment and actually make it attractive. Yeah. And, and there we can find a balance, in, uh, in my opinion. Yeah. Have you, yeah. You said you've been working on this on since 2011, so maybe you're one of the first architects who really dived this deep. Uh, or uh, 1884, uh, there were already m people in New York. <laughs> yeah, I'm pretty sure that's it's, yeah. it's, it's been a, a ra around for even longer. Yeah. But my question yeah. really is like, how was it like a light switch that went went on in you yourself, or how did you get so into this? Uh, it was a, a research project, so we received a grant, and we worked with industry partners, research institutes, uh, just to understand it at first. And then, as architects, yeah, you always need to come up with a design idea. So we also challenged uh, each other a bit. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's where uh, the ideas of color came up and patterns and basically freedom of design. Yeah. So, yeah. Uh, yeah. yeah. And it's a slow process. Yeah, it's exactly. Uh, it's a, that's indeed, it's a slow process, but it can't be really, right? Because we need to speed it up. We need to catalyze this, this movement also in, in this industry. So... I'm curious on your thoughts around that. Like, how can we kind of fast forward into the future and get more partners to move in this direction that you guys are have been on for a while? Yeah, I think uh, Marianne is spreading the the message, the message quite well. Evangelizing. And th <laughs> yeah, and I think it's uh, talking about it a lot because it's uh, in a way it's a design topic, but it's also a highly technological topic. Yeah. So there are some uh, parameters behind it to get it right. And you need to explain it to people, and people need to understand it, and they need to run with it, basically. So you think that once we understand it, we'll do it? Or is there more at play? Yeah, once you understand what's possible, and get excited about it, uh, and uh, yeah, start to use it. Yeah. 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 And it's also about regulation, because the moment that uh, a building has to be uh, energy positive, yeah. uh, that changes everything, because uh, the, as I know it, like... 
uh, when b building a building, the uh, solar panels were the last one to put in on the building and also the first thing that we're taking out of the building mm -hmm. because of uh, cost uh, reduction. And if it's, yeah, that's that has to change now, so that's good. Yeah, yeah. Is there already a question in here? I mean, yeah, please go. Solar needs to be made more beautiful, um, and, and your work is indeed very beautiful. But maybe in the future of actually applying solar on the large scale that we need, um, those cheap and, and really efficient solar panels are going to be the more realistic option. And I was wondering, because aesthetics also change a lot over time, like I'm sure the, tram, the modern trams in Amsterdam uh, probably weren't that pretty at the time when they were installed, but now no one thinks about them maybe kind of a solar-covered Amsterdam might be seen as beautiful in the future, even if they're not these very fancy and probably more expensive colors. So is your question, like, maybe we should just do it and not think about what people I guess find what, beautiful too much? Or? I guess how, how important is it to actually really redesign all of solar to make it less efficient and maybe more expensive when we're still not even close to having enough solar to power everything okay interesting question yeah um i mean it, i don't think there's like just one solution and yes we need to have the I mean, especially the industry and that also we also need still needs uh wind power as well uh, next to solar and we need the energy transition very fa fast so uh, that's why we like building all these um solar fields but kind of like the, the estimation and calculation of like the implementation we're kind of really like way it is going way better than we expected actually mm. so that's very i mean if you look at the numbers like the netherlands are doing super well is that uh, really true yeah it's really true as in how like, because I, I always feel like we're the slowest in, yeah, we, in the yeah, class, we're, yeah. So we're not like the best of the class yet no. but we're, <laughs> we're still like uh I mean, it was like the nice article from uh, bim sink about this and he's uh he's like uh like the sort of the father of uh, the solar uh solar energy of the netherlands and he's been working on this topic for a very long time and, you, and really he really could see this whole development and now the line is going really like this. So that's mm. good news. But I don't think, um, yeah, the how the solar panels are made now is are they uh, kind of like made in very bad conditions. Uh, They're um, yeah not circular. So I think it's also not, a uh, good design is not only making things pretty. It's really also thinking about like, how is it circular? How can you, after 10 years, take it apart, reuse it? That's also part of the design, how it's been made and how it's, is it going to last in the future. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. How would you respond to that, Tom? Uh, yeah, so I, I think um, the first part of the answer is, although it might uh, look very expensive, we, we try to develop it in a way that it's, say, roughly 20% more expensive. So it's quite relative. Um, and then, um, yeah, I think the... The, the point is that say uh, what I suggested to Wim Sinke is that if we if we if we produce enough of these solutions uh, and especially also the the solar panels they they have quite a, a long lifetime they can easily go for 40 or 50 years instead of the the 30 years that are sold for is that eventually once we produce enough it, it will become free the energy and Wim, Wim said well you cannot say that because mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> was not allowed to say that but say if you think about it in a in a in a more visionary way i think that would be the goal because every day the sun comes up mm -hmm. and if you have an old solar panel and it still works it's it's free yeah. so yeah. anyway in abundance yeah. yeah and and for us yeah i think there are different types of projects there m might be a, a client who has a higher budget and they want uh, a color uh, and then at least we have now the possibility to propose that. And yeah. sometimes we also propose a range of solutions so people can just choose. Yeah. yeah. Okay, so we're saying it's not actually that much more expensive uh, and it might actually be a catalyst in, in itself because more clients might want to take it up or get creative with it. And it's also <coughs> about that the current way of producing the solar panels and you know their circularity is not up to par right now. So it's also really a moment to rethink yeah. Uh, mm -hmm. That part, yeah. Okay. And maybe a final uh, 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 thought on that is that we also made panels that are kind of uh, mimicry panels. So we had a print which was basically kind of the, the typical Dutch uh, red brick. And uh, mm. at first we thought nobody would be interested, but somehow, <laughs> yeah, th th they find it very, uh, people find it exciting. 
and that would be a way actually to, to hide the PV uh, and you still have it and it's hidden but it's uh, Solution. Yeah, yeah I like this fact that you kind of like when you look at a marble surface, you're not questioning what is efficiency, what is it, what is giving it meat, but you look at this as a nice material. And if you have a so marble solar or something even more beautiful, you, sh yeah, then you can also enjoy that and it's activating and it's giving you power. So it's a yeah. win win. Yeah, exactly. Nice. All right. I want to almost round off this part of the program and then we'll have a lot more space for a conversation here but just uh, for everyone who is watching it back at home um marianne as you already said you know the solar biannual is going to light up rotterdam september october dutch design week as well um how can people stay connected how can they stay in the loop how can mm. they be part of the movement well next week on the, uh, the 5th of july there's a new website of the solar biennial and you can uh, become a, a yeah, solar mover or join the movement and uh, that will be all uh, online next week nice nice and you can subscribe to the newsletter to f to uh, follow all the updates how do we sub subscribe is that already possible if you go to yeah that's already possible yeah where, where do we do that the www.thesolarbiennial.com <laughs> <laughs> nice <laughs> Great, and there you can also find more about the different events and the seminars and labs and the exhibition. And um, yeah, it, it is really uh, quite something new and something, you know, that, that uh, I'm happy to be a part of in this way. Um, also check out the agenda for Podcasts Weiger. Every day there is programming on the energy transition and inclusion and all the topics that we need to be thinking about and need to be having conversations around um, and uh, you can also once we round up you'll see a QR code in your screen if you scan it you can become a member of Podcast is Weiger because we always want to keep everything free but in this way we can make it bigger and make it you know you can think along uh, with what is happening here thank you so much to uh, our three speakers thank you you all for joining here thank you for watching and uh, see you at the solar biannual Thank you.